Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today's guest is a very long time friend of his met, Thomas Michel, Jesuit priest, uh, now living in St. Louis and teaching at a university in Northern Thailand. Uh, welcome to our program. Thank you very much, Ali. It's good to be here. Thank you for accepting our invitation uh, among, among your very busy times. Um, I would like to uh, start with uh, the question that how, when did you uh, get to know Hizmet and how did you learn about Hizmet? Well, you know, that would take us back to about 1986. Uh, there was, I was working at the Vatican and there was an educational exchange between Uni University of Ankara and the Vatican. And, and a, a Turkish professor came to teach about Islam in Rome. And I went to Turkey and I was teaching in the University of Ankara in the Divinity School. And a number of my students were students of the Risale Nur. And they invited me to read the uh, Risale Nur with them, which we did for about uh, a year while I was in Ankara. After that, there was a Risale Nur Congress in, uh, in Istanbul. And I was invited to give kind of a, a, a Christian interpretation or a Christian reflection, I guess you'd say, on the Risale Nur. And I went and I gave it. And uh, after my talk, some of the uh, students who were there uh, asked if I wanted to meet uh, their hoja. And so uh, uh, I agreed, of course. And uh, that was the first time I met Hoja Fendi was at the Risali Nur Congress in, in Istanbul. And then, you know, every year when they had the Risali Nur Congress, sometimes Sometimes I was there, sometimes Hoja Effendi was there. And so we met uh, more. And so, so uh, through, through these meetings, I came to know more about his med and its goals and what it was trying to do. I was teaching, not teaching so much as giving lectures in a lot of parts in, in Turkey and Yerzurum and, and Diyarbakir and Mardin and Izmir and, and places. And wherever I would go, uh, I would meet uh, groups of uh, students in Hizmet, or not students, but people in Hizmet. And so I got to know them in many different places. Now, since then, since that time in the 1990s, my work has changed and I haven't been so much in Turkey, but I, uh, it does take me to a lot of places in, in Asia and in Europe and America. And almost everywhere I go, I, I try to find the Hizmet people because I feel they're kind of a, a what do you call it, a kindred spirits. And so, uh, so I've, I've known many, many people in the Hizmet movement in many parts of the world. Thank you so much. This is great. Uh, now it means that you have known and each other uh, around for 35 years. It's a really long time. And you always supported, participated in his met uh, conferences, meetings, gatherings. Uh, so you know people very well, the followers of movement and Fethullah Gülen very well. Maybe several times you met with him. So uh, how do you uh, comment on uh, the distinctive features of the his met people and the his met movement? Well, the his met movement, of course, is from my perspective, it's Islam. And it's really a, a beautiful interpretation of Islamic teachings. So I think it comes from, from the insights of, of Hoja Effendi, who really was trying to form people who were, who were united in service, trying to build up peace and compassion among people, and that they see this as the mission of Islam in the world. And so for me, as I'm not a Muslim, I'm Catholic, uh, I, I see people that I can work with, people that I can talk with and discuss problems with. So for me, uh, I see Hizmet as, as a form of uh, a Muslim community 
that really is engaged in, be, in building peace, and dialogue, and respect in the world. Uh, I remember some years ago, I, I wrote the introduction to a book of Hoja Effendi, in which he was talking about the power of love in the world today. Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you for this insight. Uh, so in uh, these 35 years, I believe there are some instances and uh, incidents that uh, you are impressed maybe or uh, got some kind of uh, good impact. Uh, can you talk uh, much about uh, some instances that uh, you get through uh, with his met people? Sure. I think maybe two, uh, two examples come to mind right away. The first one was in Turkey itself, in, uh, in Konya. I was supposed to teach for the semester at the Ilahiyat University in uh, Seljuk University. And uh, so I went to Konya and of course I didn't have a place to stay, uh, but uh, the university gave me a, a stipend to, to, to rent an apartment. And I rented an apartment in the older section of, of Konya and, and it was good apartment, except it was completely empty. It was there nothing, there was nothing in it. And uh, so I was mentioning at the university before I started teaching the first day, that I had an apartment, but it was empty. And, and so I was, uh, uh, I was needing to, to, to furnish it, you know, bed, chairs, table, that kind of thing. And uh, so somebody at, at the university said, well, I know somebody down in the city and they've got an extra bed. If you ask them, they, they might uh, be able to help you out. So I said, okay, that's a good idea. So I went down and asked the people and, uh, they said, oh yes, we do have an extra bed. You're, you're welcome to it. So I took the bottom part of the bed and put it on my shoulders and was walking about 10 minute walk to my new apartment. And it was a Saturday morning. Many people were out, you know, they were shopping and, and doing errands and that kind of thing. And they saw this foreigner, me, carrying a, uh, a bed on his back and they said, uh, uh, well, where are you going? And I said, I, I, I've got an apartment and I'm going to be staying there. And they said, oh, really? Uh, they said, well, what are you doing in Konya? And, and I said, well, I'm going to be teaching at the Ilahiyat faculty. And uh, they said, well, that, that's interesting. Are you Muslim? And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm Catholic. And they said, oh, oh, well, are you married? Are you here with your family? I said, no, actually, I'm I'm a priest and we don't get married. So I'm here by myself. They said, you're a priest. And I, I used the Quranic word Rahib because I wasn't sure what the proper word was in Turkish. They said, you're Rahib. And people said, uh, there are a whole group gathered around by this time. And they said, well, do you need anything for your house? I said, well, actually I need everything. All I have is this bed. And so people started bringing things. They were bringing chairs and tables and spoons and forks and dishes. And uh, somebody brought a second bed and somebody brought a carpet. And so within three days, the whole place was completely furnished. And it was, it was really, a, to me, kind of a revelation of, of, of the importance of hospitality. And they, they brought that. Well, the first day came for me to, to be teaching and I went to the university. And when I came home in the afternoon, there was a man sitting on the steps outside my door. And, uh, and I said, hello. And, and he, he said, you know, I came by earlier, but I, I couldn't get in. The door was locked. And I said, well, yes, I, I did lock it before I went to the university this morning. He said, oh, you don't have to do that. He said, the women in the neighborhood, they know who comes and who goes. And if anybody is here who doesn't belong, they'll take care of it. So I thought that was kind of a curious answer. And I thought, what, what is he driving at? And then I, I thought, well, maybe by locking my door, I'm telling the people of the neighborhood that I don't trust them. So I never locked my door again. I always left it open. And sometimes I was really surprised. I'd come home from the university and on the, on the, on the table, there'd be a, a covered dish with some rice in it and some lamb and some, 
and some cooked vegetables or, or eggplant. And uh, I would eat it. Generally, it was enough for two days or so, two, three days. And then a couple of days later, the, the dish would disappear. And sometimes I came home and all my shirts would be washed and ironed and hanging on hangers. And, you know, I never saw who did this. I presume it was different women in the, in the neighborhood, neighbor, neighbor ladies, but I never saw them. And this went on for a whole semester and people were really taking care of me, even though I rarely saw them. I was at the university all day. Well, when it was time for me to leave after about six months in Konya, a man came by and he to say goodbye. And so we were saying goodbye and I said, you know, I have uh, one final request. And he said, well, what's that? And I said, well, you know, the women of the neighborhood have been taking really good care of me for um, months now. They've been doing all sorts of good things, cleaning my clothes, leaving me different kinds of food and bakeries and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, I'd like to meet them just once so that I could thank them. And his answer has always stayed with me, even though it was 35 years ago. He said, you don't have to thank them. They didn't do this for you. They did this for God. And God who sees what we do in secret will give them their reward. And I always remember that. That was a that was for me kind of a powerful experience. Very, very impressive, very impressive. Uh, yeah. But let me tell you about my other experience. Please. This was not in Turkey. This took place in the Southern Philippines. And you might remember that for some time there was quite a bit of uh, tension or unrest in the Southern Philippines, especially with Muslims on one side and Christians on the other side. And there was a sporadic violence and kind of the threat of violence so much. And also the government didn't seem to have complete control down in the South. And so you'd, you'd also like get bandits and, and snipers and that. And so uh, one day I was down in Zamboanga in the very Southern tip of the Philippines. And I went with uh, some uh, uh, friends from Hizmet to a new school that they had uh, in out, outside Zamboanga. It was maybe about half hour outside Zamboanga. So we went out there and it was the sort of situation where you kind of were looking around, you know, cause you didn't know if there were gonna be bandits or, or, or uh, snipers or what, you know. And, and so this, you go farther and farther from the city, you, you get more nervous. And at one point we turned the corner and go in this drive and there's a big sign up and it said, the Turkish Filipino School of Tolerance. Mm -hmm. So you go through there and it was the school and there you saw Muslim and Christian teachers and administrators having this school, children playing together, studying together. And since it was a boarding school, living together in, in, in many cases. And it was really kind of a, a little island of peace in the, in the midst of this uh, environment of, of tension and, and outbreaks of violence. So that's always impressed me that, that when you put the practices of, or the teachings of his met and Hoja Effendi into practice, that's what you're creating is, 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 is an island of peace. Thank you so much for uh, these uh, comments and insights. Um, as a person who uh, knew Hoji Effendi for uh, 35 years and met a couple, a couple of times with him, uh, how do you see some distinctive and characteristic features of Hoji Effendi as a leader uh, compared to other leaders? I like his teaching, you know, uh, since, I'm, since I'm a teacher myself, uh, I've really been asked many times to comment on one or another aspects of the teaching of, of Hoja Fendi. So I've given many talks and published a lot of articles in that. And, uh, and what really strikes me is the clarity of his teaching and the 
depth of Islamic insight that, that is combined with an openness to others. That Muslims, he doesn't expect Muslims to go it themselves in, in this world, but that people of different groups are, are, are supposed to work together. Now we use this kind of a shortcut for that dialogue people talking together and working together. And I find that to be a, a really important feature of the, uh, of the writings of Hoja Fenty. Now I have to confess, I'm kind of a, uh, a beginner, you know, I, I, I shouldn't consider myself an expert because I, since I don't really uh, know Turkish, I've missed many of, his, uh, many of his talks and many of his articles that only appear in, in Turkish. So I really only know the things that uh, that have appeared in English. Uh, thank you for this as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's a big purge going on in Turkey right now against the Hizmet followers uh, for the last seven years now, now maybe. Uh, it's at the level of genocide right now. Uh, how would you comment on this? Uh, and the uh, reactions of the Hizmet people against this purge and genocide? Well, of course, it's a terrible thing. I've written myself about the, about the genocide and the, and the terrible uh, aftermath of, of the government's decision uh, to, to persecute the people in the Hizmet movement. I've known many people that I worked together when I was in, when I was in uh, Turkey, schools that I taught at and visited and and now these people are, are in Greece or Germany or America or Australia and it's just painful to see really good dedicated well-educated people being in situations of families torn apart and people put in prison and uh, schools and hospitals hospitals that I that I went to when I when I was sick you know taken away taken away and uh, and you know the, the works with the with their with the vision of being lost and uh, so I, I can see how it's just a, a really difficult time for people in Hizmet. and it would you would almost be tempted to to uh, to give up hope that things will be better but my own feeling is that when we look, we take the long look, you know, 20 years down the line, 30, 40 years down the line. I think that uh, the people in this government will be gone. They'll have retired, they'll have died. But the Hizmet movement will still be working. We see its work in so many countries uh, outside uh, Turkey, here in the United States, all the, all the schools, the charter schools and, and other kinds of projects where I know much more I, closely are the schools that uh, his movement has in places like Thailand and, and uh, Indonesia and Myanmar, places in, in Asia where they're doing really good work, work of education and the work of bringing people together. In many of those countries, the only dialogue movements that are really active are those that are run by people in, in Hizmet. So I think, you know, when you take the long run, uh, we're, going to, we're going to see that, that this is a kind of a time for people to really, to, to become, to, to give a deeper commitment because it's not so easy up until, the, up until the persecution. It was easy, you know, there were a lot of activities and there was, good to see people and easy to see people. Now it's difficult. It takes a lot more commitment to the, to the vision of Hizmet. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, how do you see the future of Hizmet? Uh, are you hopeful? Uh, because uh, even uh, despite uh, the big purge and kind of extermination and genocide against Hizmet people, they are still working, uh, at least outside of Turkey, in the United States, in democratic uh, Western countries. So uh, how do you see the future of Hizmet and uh, what do you advise to the Hizmet people at this time? Well, as I said, the, uh, I'm hopeful about the future of Hizmet because 
Hizmet is providing a needed service, not only in the Muslim community, but in the world community. It's they're, they're doing something that, not just something that's extra or something we could do without, but they're, they're providing a, a service that really is needed. And so I think that uh, there will always be this need for people in, in Hizmet to do that. Of course, they're doing it mostly through the schools and through the dialogue projects, through the, the works of charity that they're, that they're carrying out. Uh, and this is outside of Turkey, but these things are all, are all needed. And uh, so, so I am hopeful. And you say, well, what should they do? I'd say, well, just stick close to the ideals uh, that Hoja Fendi uh, gives in, in his teaching. Uh, really follow these things. Don't give up hope, because what uh, what you're doing is 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 fulfilling a need that otherwise wouldn't be done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before closing, uh, would you like to add anything before closing? Well, uh, no. It's just a, it, It's one of the. Just to say this, one of the joys of my life the last 30 plus years or so is the times that I've spent with people in his met and the people that I've come to know through the his met movement, really dedicated, uh, visionary people. I mean, that's, that's really, a, that's enriched my life greatly. And it's something that I, that I'm really grateful for. It's been, it's been a blessing from God to, to know and to be involved even in a small way in, uh, in, the, in the life of the, of the Hizmet movement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and uh, all supports that you have given so far. And have a great day. Thank you, Ali. It was a pleasure to be here. And greetings to all my friends in Hizmet. Thank you. Dear watchers, uh, see you at the next program.